All right, Peter Crone, thanks for coming on the show, brother. I'm excited to see where this conversation takes us. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, and I am equally curious to see what comes up. So I think here's where I want to start. You know, you've always resonated with me, your energy, your approach, your delivery uh, as well, too. You're not afraid to call people out on their bullshit. And I mean, I suppose as I say that, you might pick that apart and say, well, I'm not really calling people out. I'm more so, you know, maybe at the risk of offending them or triggering them, I'm willing to shift their perspective and, and maybe uh, awaken them to something that they maybe didn't realize was going on. Um, Am I accurate in that, uh, you know, in, in that description, uh, in that analysis? And, and I also know that people would maybe say you have a tough love approach. I don't suppose maybe you like that term uh, as well, too. It's kind of maybe doesn't share the whole story or maybe it's a little juvenile. But I'm curious, am I accurate, accurate in that? And how would you describe your overall approach? Yeah, I, I'd say you're accurate on both in terms of calling people out you know the actual framing of that particular choice of wording seems like it's a judgmental approach it's really not like basically i'm a stand for people's freedom and their greatness right so we could say that beneath that there's just a profound caring for people's divine nature you know without sounding too poetic so the tough love I mean, love has got many components to it, right? Like you'd want a father who's loving, but equally at some level gives you the principles of responsibility, discipline, dedication. You know, you could say, is that tough or does that make you an extraordinary human being when you become an adult? So um, I, I'm, always, I'm always coming from a position of what I consider to be truth as best as I know it, not Peter Crone's truth, but truth that is universal such that people can break beyond their subconscious limitations that get in the way of them discovering their own greatness. So I, you know, there's no apology for that. I, uh, I love making people, you know, better and more free and more at peace and more vital and more wealthy and all the things that I assert humans want. So. Yeah, there's a really good quote. I, I, I say it probably too often at this point, but I just, I love it so much. And I don't know who to attribute it to because Google won't really tell you it, it, attribute it attributes it to a bunch of different people, uh, maybe Carl Sagan, uh, but it's that in which can be destroyed by the truth should be. And I believe that in moments, uh, if you're, you know, maybe a coach or maybe even sometimes maybe a, a confidant or a friend uh, to maybe offer a different perspective or, you know, give someone what you believe to be the truth, what they need to hear, not necessarily what they always want to hear, yeah. that may destroy their inner peace in that moment. That may trigger them. Yeah. Uh, that may, uh, you know, offend them, yeah. which you often talk about, as I do, that that might be the most beautiful opportunity for growth and expansion and to learn how to emotionally regulate. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about, about that, about because we live in a world where there is uh, a great, uh, in large part, a group of society who is trying to really shut down even just the opportunity to trigger people, uh, the opportunity to offend. Yeah. Why is that such an opportunity? You talk about how our freedom actually lies uh, on the other side of those triggers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, a couple of sort of subtle refinements to what you shared. I would say that it's it might seem like it's disturbing someone's peace, but it's actually for the intention of discovering true peace. So there's a distinction there. And secondly, the part of us that gets offended is not us, right? So one of my quotes, you I'm sure you're familiar, I tend to write in quotes a lot. And I say, if it's not life-threatening, then it's just ego-threatening. So the part of anybody that gets triggered, assuming they're not like about to be stabbed or shot, <laughs> is literally their own identity and more profoundly, the absence of security within it. So, you know, there's a great line in, I think it's the third matrix where the head of defense for Zion, which is the home of all the free souls, has asked all the captains of the ship to bring the ships back. You know, and Morpheus, I'm assuming you're familiar with some of the Matrix trilogy or now there's four mm -hmm. of them. Um, so uh, he leaves his ship, the Ebuchadnezzar, out 
in the quote unquote matrix so that they can communicate with the Oracle. And the reason they want to be able to communicate with the Oracle, the foreseer of the fate is so that they can determine whether Neo is in fact the one, right? So that's the premise. That is the belief system behind which he goes against the orders of his boss and leave his ship out there in the matrix. And when he comes back, he gets called into the head of defense's office, who is now, you know, fuming and says, damn it, Morpheus, you know, I commanded that everyone bring their ship back. And he said, he explains, well, I left it out there because we want to be able to communicate with the Oracle to discover the fate of the one. And the boss says, damn it, Morpheus, not everyone believes what you believe. And his response is, my beliefs do not require them to. Mm. And right there, it's, you know, the assertion of power of a gnosis, not a knowing that's mental, but a guttural intuition that um, is where I assert I speak from. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do feel very confident when I'm listening to somebody that I can certainly point out the pretense in their language. And that's, is, you know, to quote your quote, that Google won't re reveal who said, but you know, if something gets destroyed by the truth, then it should, right? Or paraphrasing whatever you said. I, I love that. So yeah, so I'm just I'm just pointing out the, the, the lies that people are stuck within, and invariably that leads to a very happy ending. <laughs> so uh, I'm assuming you would call that ego kind of the self concept, this illusory idea of who we are. These narratives that are on repeat in our subconscious about who we believe ourselves to be that are primarily formed from, you know, often childhood and, you know, coming from our environment and our experiences that then kind of run the show, right? It kind of creates yeah. all of our, or at least 90 to 95% science will tell us, uh, you know, our actions, our ideas, our emotions, uh, our thoughts, which then obviously have a, a great effect on our external and conditional uh, world, right? Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about ego and, you know, I, I love how you talk about how, you know, you make a really good point. It's like, I'm not offending them. I'm offending this bullshit picture in their head of who they think they are. Right. Yeah. But I want to talk about the delicate dance of ego of like, when can we use ego? When should we actually even leverage it? You know, maybe I'm of the belief that I wouldn't even be on that. We wouldn't be on this uh, podcast if we didn't have ego and some sort of blueprint for where we want to go and who we want to be. Yeah. But can we talk about the delicate dance of, of using it, leveraging it, and even, and, and then on the other side, I guess this is where the dance is, is like, when is it of disservice? And when is it even destructive to our lives? Yeah, great questions. I would go back a little bit to something you said of like who we believe ourselves to be. So I would, I would adjust that slightly. It may be an uncommon use of language, but I say it's not who we believe ourselves to be, it's who we are for ourselves. Uh. Right, so belief is an extension of the who we are that we are. So it's even deeper and that's why it's so slippery because it's not so much that I believe I'm not good enough, it's maybe that someone is that they are not good enough and therefore the beliefs are, I'm not gonna get the promotion or I'm not gonna get married or I won't be successful, right? So it's subtle, but there's that sort of hierarchy of conditioning. So the who that we are for ourselves is at the deepest level. And that is formed through these, you know, experiences in childhood, not that we're victims of, but I would assert they're the catalysts that turn on the constraints that we arrive with in this incarnation, which gets a little esoteric, but I'm happy to speak to that. And so from that perspective of, it is the who that you are for yourself that gives rise to the thoughts, beliefs, then the feelings, the actions, and then the outcome. So they truly are commensurate with the identity that we offer ourselves in terms of the results that we get. Most people look at behaviors, like you go and see an expert and they're like, well, don't do this, do that, right? So you're in the realm of action. And you may, if you've got some willpower, be able to overcome the deep seated programming that drives your natural actions by using the instructional actions to compensate and get a different outcome. But it's usually short-lived and this is why people call it self-sabotage or self-fulfilling prophecy or people at the beginning of the year will join a gym, they'll ante up the hundred bucks a month or a hundred pounds a month or whatever it is to join a gym and then middle of February, they've already quit. So 
it's important to understand what the access is to power. So in terms of your question of leveraging the ego, well, I mean, look, people leverage their ego all day. It's how they get laid. It's how they find a date. It's how they make money. It's how they, you know, cheat in exams at school or people are doing it every day. It's an inert, innate way of surviving. So we can use the ego to propagate our existence and to have this fallacious form of value in the marketplace or a way that we garner attention or, or attract a mate. Like, you know, it, 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 when you describe it that way, it all sounds sort of quite, well, it's certainly inauthentic, but it, it sounds kind of malicious and it's really not. I mean, human beings are doing the best they can to survive, right? So that's how people leverage their ego all the time. Anything that they've attained usually is by virtue of the fact that they learned to be a good boy, a good girl. They learned to be a good performer. They learned to be sexy and beautiful. They learned to be smart. They learned to whatever they had to do in order to get love and affection ultimately. And so it gets leveraged, but at what cost is my question, right? That's, that's where for me, the sort of the ultimate catch 22 of that whole phenomenon is that yes, you might attain the, out, the outside results that you want and it may even seem like you're very successful as a person but it's cliche like everybody knows the multi-millionaire or god forbid a multi-billionaire who is either addicted to drugs is lonely is miserable his kids hate him he's on his fourth marriage or she whatever it is so okay you leverage to a certain point but the impact invariably is still in the realm of suffering so my commitment is to the dissolution of the ego. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but it's the transcendence of these constraints, these inadequacies, insecurities, the experience of scarcity, such that we fall into the deeper, profound nature of who we truly are at our essence, whether you call it consciousness, the absolute, God, whatever word floats your boat. So in the absence of the ego, we're left ironically with all the qualities and the values that the ego has been trying to get. Mm. Damn. Yeah. You talk about dissolution, not solution, <clears throat> right. yeah. which I really like. Um, it's, it's not so much even, you know, I suppose you would say when you approach like a, a client that you're coaching and you wouldn't say, you know, this is the solution. This is like, you know, the strategy that we're going to, it's more so let's shift your perspective and let's look at the ego and how this is really driving, you know, your, your thoughts, your approach and, and your inner peace that you have in this moment. Right. Yeah. Um, so I like that. I, I want to maybe then shift a little bit. I think it's very related. Uh, you talk about really maybe the most noble pursuit or maybe the most um, meaningful or effective pursuit to a good life, let's say, is to be at peace regardless of circumstance, right? And we, we yeah. talk about this all the time in the personal growth world. And, you know, it's don't give your power away to the external world and the conditional world, right? Yeah. I, I, I'm really interested in and this is obviously in relation to ego and those narratives going on inside and the bullshit picture we have in our head about how the world works and how we work i want to ask you about your thoughts on it's not that i disagree with uh that one of the the most noble goals is to be at peace regardless of circumstance but one may say that What's interesting about that is I believe that maybe what's even more important than inner peace in life, and you can tell me whether you agree with this or not, is meaning, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, you know, it's like at your parents' funeral, right? You know, Jordan Peterson talks about this, like, are you going to be happy or are you going to have inner peace at your parents' funeral? Well, no, you're going to have a very human experience of probably yeah. sorrow and despair. Yeah. Um, so maybe the more noble pursuit is meaning. And what's interesting is if we were to get there to where, it, you know, outside circumstances didn't affect our inner peace, what does that do for ambition? Because ambition is actually the prerequisite for a lot of the things that bring us the most meaning in life, being a parent, having a romantic relationship, building a business, coming on this podcast. Yeah. So it's almost like maybe to summarize that in, in short, it's, it's asking you, Peter, like, okay, if that's the main goal, well, what about meaning? Where does that play in? And what does being at peace regardless of circumstance do for ambition? Because if I'm always at peace, no matter what's going on around me, then why am I going to get off the couch? Yeah, 
No, great questions. And that's why I would just make, again, a subtle adjustment to what is otherwise a, a great question, which is my, that's not my main goal. Like I say, that is, I, I equate that to success, but my main products, as I'm sure you would have heard me say, is freedom. So now freedom, we could argue, is somewhat akin to and maybe even a bedfellow of peace. But freedom to me has a subtle different quality, which to your point, yes, if someone is totally at peace, we could argue that, well, then where's the motivation or the dedication to anything because you're just content. But that's not really the piece I speak about. Peace to me is really a byproduct of being free. Now, if we're completely free, then it takes the shackles off, the governor off, the pursuit of everything whether it be self-expression, which could be bawling your eyes out at your parents' for a funeral versus somebody who's not at peace or free might feel that it's incumbent upon them as the older sibling to hold it together for their younger siblings because they wanna be the now new man or woman of the house in the absence of the parent. That's a conditioned response based on survival and the identity that feels that it needs to behave a certain way. There's neither freedom nor peace there, right? So. For me, freedom is the ultimate goal. Now, we could do a deep dive on what that means. For me, predominantly, it means being out of the way of any of the constraints of the subconscious, which I assert we're born with, right? The feelings of, if there were three main buckets, it's inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity. Freedom, therefore, then becomes a prerequisite to true motivation because you're now in the absence of fear. It's like you are like a child who has full ex expression, full capacity to explore anything without any ramifications because your mind isn't predicting a worst case scenario that will then debilitate somebody and gives them the experience of procrastination. So now peace is then the byproduct of that because if I'm free to fully express myself, that might be verbally, it might be in terms of my behaviors, but in terms of my potential, then there's a peace that arises from that because I'm no longer in the resignation of regret or the constraint of feeling worthless and who am I to pursue whatever it is that I'm here to pursue. So I, it's close, but for sure, if someone is just totally at peace, we could argue, yes, then there is no motivation, but we could equally on the flip side at a more subtle level say, well, if they're totally at peace, well then who cares if there's no motivation? They've already won the game, right? But to me, that isn't the most powerful way to live. The most powerful way to live is, is to be completely unleashed, right? To be completely free in the way that we express our feelings, our ambitions, our, our authentic self. So whether it be in relationship to a lover, to a family member, to a pursuit, to a profession with my athletes, if they've got any constraint, then there is neither freedom nor peace. So I feel that they're commensurate with one another but freedom is the precursor to the latter. I love how you brought up children. I think, I mean, obviously there's so much to learn when we observe children. And I think that they have, they, they, they don't attain it. They, they inherently have it because they haven't been conditioned against it. They have that freedom to a certain extent, if I'm not mistaken, of what you're talking about. Their, their frontal lobes of their brain isn't as developed, so they don't think as much about the future or the past. They also don't have the same kind of expectations. Right. Um, I've heard of you talk about how, um, I actually really liked when you talked about, uh, the, it was a Cowboys and Indians, that game where you, you know, as a kid you play and you have, you know, yeah. and the kids are out in the forest and they find this, this stick yeah. And, you know, the, the child looks at it as a gun and he doesn't think, oh, this gun isn't good enough. It's not perfect. He just, in, you know, instinctively picks up the stick and makes do with it because he doesn't have any further expectations where an adult, you mentioned, like they would have the Cowboys and Indians like, you know, subscription to the magazine and they would be like, I got to get the best gun and this, that, and the other thing. Right. And kids don't have that. Is that that freedom Yes. that you're really talking about? Yeah. Yeah, and it also speaks to your point about meaning, which, you know, it's a, it's a slippery subject because I've often, when people ask me, well, what's the meaning of life? And I say, it's relatively simple. It's whatever you make it mean, right? So we ultimately are all living within our own worlds, right? There are many, there are as many worlds on the planet as there are human minds, right? Because everybody has their own interpretation. So 
we could to the point about, and, and I'm flattered that you remember that story that I said, but it, it's so, it's, it's joyous, right? Because you look at a kid who doesn't need the fanciest stick, the biggest stick, the most groomed stick, or, you know, it was like, but yeah, this was the best carpenter that created this stick for my game of uh, Cowboys and Indians. So right there, we're also accessing the power of meaning, which we could equate to imagination, right? So the, the child is ascribing meaning to that game and that stick. And within his or her realm of existence, it's abundant, it's sufficient. So there's freedom in the expression of it. There's meaning in the attribution to it. And as a byproduct, there's peace because there's nothing missing. Yeah, that's the argument against the, you know, why would I get off the couch, Peter, if, um, you know, I was content no matter what the external circumstances were. Well, kids don't really, I mean, they don't have any reason to get off the couch, but yet they do. Inherently, there is some something in our wiring, in our biology that gets us to get off our butt and into the world and explore. And it's it's the absence of those, again, I'm going to go back to the bullshit picture in our head of the way we think things need to be other in other words expectations it's the absence of that that allows us to expand into imagination expand into that peace and freedom and then let the inherent you know way in which we're wired just you know take place and that we're going to go out and we're going to explore yeah and it's not going to be coming from as much of a place of lack and like i want this thing which want would mean that there's something missing, right? It's more just, let's go out and fucking play, right? It's uh, beautifully articulated and why I say that one of the inherent qualities, you know, the primal urges of, we could argue consciousness itself, but for that reason is built into the human psyche is curiosity. The number one word, do you have kids? I don't. I have a niece and nephew. I'm the world's okay. best uncle, I think. I'm sure. So, um, so you can just by virtue of through them, I, if I would ask you, what is the most common word any child, certainly below, below the ages of two or three, what do they say? Why? Exactly. So inbuilt into the human operating system is the fascination and hence the curiosity of what it means to be alive. Wow. Now that gets squashed usually through trauma, hurt, pain, suffering, disappointment, failures. And so what was previously the full self-expression of absolute exploration due to the undercurrent of curiosity became self-protection. It became, I don't wanna be hurt again. And so that again is where freedom commensurate with peace is uh, their bedfellows of self-exploration. And it's one of my you know, favorite distinctions. I say, most people are searching, I'm exploring. Mm. Yeah, I love that. So I wanna go back because, you know, I always try and put my, my uh, I, I try and put myself in the shoes of the listener here and I'm sure people are okay so and i talk about this a lot with other guests i personally talk about this a lot you know just in in terms of my approach how our psychology is wired to to validate our internal beliefs and you talk a lot about this illusory like you know version of 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 who we are for ourselves am i using the right terminology yeah 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 um so these narratives that are going on within our psychology that affect so much of how we show up in this world yeah. and and our expectations right with the cowboys and indians situation i want to ask you know again trying to put myself in the shoes of the listener i know a lot of people are like okay yes i get it i have these narratives going on i have this you know picture of who i am for myself that's yeah. that's affecting how i show up in this world it's getting in my way it's a block and a barrier what are some of the foundational steps of just beginning to, I guess, uh, expand beyond those and not be, not have them in the driver's seat, be in more, not control, I'm sure you'd use a different word, but maybe be able to, to navigate or, and move through these so it doesn't always get in the way. Yeah, beautiful question. And I love your commitment to your listeners. Um, I think the first and the most easily accessible way to discover where we're held back is to see where we get upset. 
Right. So this day and age, you know, everyone seems to be offended by everything, but equally ashamed of nothing. <laughs> I saw a meme the other day, which was pretty funny. Um, but in terms of that triggering, which has obviously become a popular word to, oh, I'm so triggered. You know, well, whatever that trigger is, first of all, is not because of the exogenous stimulus, which is where most people seem to attribute the responsibility. Oh, well, I'm upset because of, you know, fill in the blank, my boss, my spouse, my, my dad. No, they did or said something, but that revealed within you, one of my quotes again, I say, life will present you with people and circumstance to reveal where you're not free. So that's the first place for listeners to look is like right now, looking at every arena of your life. And there's not that many as humans. Like we talk about our health, we talk about our wealth and our career. We talk about families and relationships and pretty much it. You know, they're the sort of the big containers for every relationship, uh, sorry, every conversation. So wherever there is some sort of disarray, dysfunction, disharmony, suffering that you have right now in your life, the access to more freedom, so the sort of I'm looking at this sliding scale of freedom from complete constraint, you know, you're in solitary confinement in prison to, you know, the quintessential example of a child who's got no inhibitions. Um, where, where on that scale can you discover where you've got the absence of freedom? Where, where were you upset by something? So that's the first place to look. Then you want to, as best as you can, sometimes it's easier with someone who you know you trust or will listen carefully, somebody you feel unjudged by, you can start to talk through, well, what happened? Like, what did they like really break down the reality of what transpired versus what did that make you feel? And then in that feeling is where the treasure is, right? So I felt scared, I felt abused, uh, um, unacknowledged, I felt like I wasn't special, I felt like a failure, whatever it is. So, okay, then where did you experience that before? And go back as long as you can, and especially into your childhood, and where did you feel not safe before? Where did you feel not loved before? And then you start to recognize these, what I call these primal negations. Negation, just a fancy word for when we feel we're not something, right? I'm not good enough. I'm not loved, I'm not wanted, I'm not safe, I'm not valuable. And this is, to me, these are the, the pillars of the formation of that who that we are for ourselves. And that's, the freedom is on the other side of those because we realize that the I'm not something has got evidence, but it's not a truth. And in the absence of that constraint, that's when we discover freedom. So, um... If I could, you know, describe it in uh, maybe a more like in short way, is it really kind of what, you know, someone like Dr. Joe Dispenza will talk about? It's becoming conscious of your unconscious programs. Is that essentially a good way to put it? You know, you're waking up in that moment and being like, instead of unconsciously respond or sorry, instead of unconsciously reacting to yeah. all those conditioned subconscious programs, you're yeah. consciously responding absolutely accurate and beautifully put and i use the same words it's just easier said than done right so we want to have compassion and patience with people as human beings we're very complex and certainly the intricacies of the ego tend to be very slippery and insidious so that's why i wanted to give it a little bit more of a breakdown but that's what's happening yes people are coming from i call it more subconscious unconscious to me is at a deeper level, it's a different conversation. But the subconscious is really the foundation of what we're aware of. The thoughts of someone in Los Angeles is, oh, I'm never gonna meet a good man in LA. You know, it's like, that might be the conscious thought. What that, where is that being generated from? Well, the fact that at a deeper level, she feels she's not lovable, right? Or I don't deserve love or something like that. So clearly the conscious thought, there are no good men in LA, isn't a truth, but, that human's reality, as I said earlier, there are as many worlds as there are brains. So in her world, that's how it occurs. So her view of life is being dictated, that conscious thought, because of the subconscious programming, which will typically reveal the fact that she's been hurt before, someone cheated on her before, people broke up on her before, and now she's got the evidence to use that monologue as a way of protecting herself from future hurt. So it is bringing, like I always say, there's two steps to really evolution. One, awareness, which is, to your point, bringing that which is subconscious to our conscious. So now we're aware of the pattern. And then practice the new way of being on the other side of that old conditioning. 
And I think something we don't talk about enough in that equation is grace. You know, you mentioned it, um, or maybe you alluded to it. I, I'm going to ask what I think is a really important question. And I suppose you probably don't get it too often. Maybe you do. But talk to us about how much you get triggered and how much you deal with these kind of maybe patterns that don't serve you. Um, and the reason why I ask is because I think that it's actually a, a disservice to someone who is really trying to put an honest effort into this and, and to change their life for, for the better. And they put uh, people like me and especially someone like you, who's a seasoned veteran on a pedestal. Yeah. And they think that you're just going about your life just completely enlightened and awakened and just the inner peace to the max. And I suppose, correct me if I'm wrong, that's probably not necessarily the case, although to a large extent, maybe. Talk to us about that. Sure. Uh, and again, I think, as I spoke to earlier, I think it's a sliding scale, right? Like, so who I am today for myself is radically different than who I have been at different iterations of myself through my life, right? So the younger Peter Crone was entrenched in a lot of shyness. The fear of how I appeared to other people was a bit of a perfectionist, you know, and then into my 20s had to constantly be the best at everything, whether it was academia or athletics, and just, you can feel the pressure. Even my nickname at university was Perfect Pete, right? Like, you know, I'd actually generated from my environment, my friends and moniker that maintained the pressure of who I felt I had to be, like it was insane. So that's for sure something that I share readily in all the pain and suffering that I've been through, the, do the death of my parents, the break up of the first love I had that sent me into a spiral, you know? So, but I would argue right now to answer your question more directly in present time that the triggers that occur to me are very few and far between. Like, I mean, there's an absolute reconciliation of any form of internal fear or worry or that what people think about me. The things that I tend to be more passionate about and I wouldn't say even triggered by is you know, what we've seen in the last two to three years, they're the things that I've spoken up, you know, about, which is um, being a stand for people's freedom. As I said at the beginning, like I, I'm a stand for people's greatness. And when there is a distinct oppression and a tyranny that we've seen through government agencies and sellout celebrities and paid for da da da's, like that, that's something that doesn't sit right with me. Now, it's not a trigger about me, it's really a representation of the fact that I care about humanity. <laughs> so I would say Peter Crone is pretty damn freaking okay. Like, think of me as you will. You know, money on the stock market doesn't work out. I don't have it. I don't get the client. I don't get the job. I don't get the keynote. It's okay. You know, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I'm totally, totally okay. But now it's transcended from my own quote unquote of evolution, my spiritual growth that was subjective to now something that is collective. And so that's where I become more enamored, you know, and passionate about the way I speak out. But yeah, I don't want anyone to, for any minute, think that I just woke out, came out of the womb and was just walking on water and not affected by anything, <laughs> you know? No. Yeah, because I, I think people in this process of becoming conscious and aware and like really like responding more so to these things and working on them, like I think, you know, we put this again, it comes down to our expectations, right? And it, it's, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the best approach is it's not to try and push away that internal narrative of who we are for us. It's not because what we resist persists, right? I think that actually feeds it energy. So I think it's actually to do the opposite. It's to let it in, create space for it, allow it to be there. And that kind of disarms it almost in a way, but it allows yeah. us to have this grace. And, and what we should put more attention into is just how do we respond? It's okay that it's there. It's okay that it's messy inside because we all have it. It's just what's your response, you know, like, it's okay to have a fight with your girlfriend where you're completely and overtaken by your inner child. And like, you're almost out of control at that point. But then it's what do you how do you respond after? Right? I mean, that that's really where I guess, the, the process is best executed. Um, and you can yeah. 
you know, let me that's, know your thoughts on that. That's how we evolve, right? I think, you know, I was just talking to someone else on a podcast earlier about the similar physiological reactions, right? There are certain habitual human inbuilt conditioned reactions that people have based on a threat response to something someone said or something they're sensing in the room, right? When you're in that chemical shitstorm of hormones that has been released through no conscious choice of your own, then it's akin to telling someone who's just like drunk two bottles of whiskey to come on, just be sober. It's like, it's like, it doesn't, it's asinine. It doesn't make sense. Where the power lies, and I think going back to your statement of grace, where we can have compassion and grace for ourselves is like, okay, take responsibility and maybe apologize wherever it's you know justified for your actions, like how you reacted, you got upset. But now that your system has come back to some form of homeostasis and you're calm, now you can do the analysis, right? Of like, okay, well, what was it that triggered me such that I can be responsible for that form of conditioning, that programming in me that certainly isn't beneficial. There's a cost and an impact to me, my relationships, my success. And that's the transcendence of that. That's the transfiguration, right? So that is, to your point, that's the allowing of that inner child, the ego. Like I, I use the expression, the ego doesn't want to be healed. It wants to be held. And within that, there's a love of my patterning. I just don't want to be defined by it. And in the love and acceptance of it tends to be the transmutation and the reconciliation of it. But that can't happen in the heat of the moment. When someone's upset, they're upset. And we do the best we can to obviously support them, hold them. But until such time that they've come back to, to their own version of calm or peace, there can't be proper analysis. What do you say to people, if you've heard this, I feel like there's this kind of um, push for or this narrative, if you will, out there that talks a lot about, it, it almost really undermines the approach to, you know, you, you talk about yourself as the mind architect. I love that. But there's a lot of people who talk about how the mind kind of the top down approaches, you know, it's, it's, it's just such a small part of what's really going on internally. And it's just not deep enough. You know, there's a lot of people talking about how, you know, you have to get deep, you got to get to the nervous system, you got to get to the trauma that's stored within the body and even spirit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what do you what do you say to people who say, like, you know, it's just not it's not going to be enough for many people who are so riddled with trauma and their nervous system is so dysregulated that they can't even tap into their mind. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly in my approach, I make sure that anyone I'm working with, if I'm doing a mastermind uh, with a group online or if I'm doing one on ones, whenever I'm with someone, I will use the mind as the access to the experience. It's not in the mind, right? So the mind is simply the housing it's the it's this I, I really equate mind to a space like you know part of my work with anyone and I ask them well, we talk about the mind all day but like do you know what it is and so in my philosophy I look at the mind as simply the container now we want to find out well, what's in the container right and then that's where we get to the experiences the traumas and then the associated dialogue and the narrative of I'm a piece of shit, I'm a failure, no one wants me, I'm not loved, right? So now we're looking at, okay, that's the programming that sits on the operating system, the human operating system, which is primal in terms of survival, wanting love and affection, a sense of belonging and security. These all things are innate that people have, but what's your idiosyncrasies and your subjective tweaks around that? So I will always, through those narratives, ask people when you live in that world of thinking that who you are is not enough what does that feel like and it's usually uncomfortable invariably it should be if you're within the constraint that is like you know close to the bone for them and that's where they have to feel they're like i'm exhausted it feels pointless no one gives a shit now we're accessing those deeper levels that are going to be in you know, instilled in the actual physiology of that person, that's the way to access freedom. Because if it's just a sort of mental masturbation and people can sit and use rhetoric all day and I can hang with the best of them as it relates to psychological philosophy, yeah, great. And my, oh yeah, that makes sense, that's cool. But they didn't actually feel it. Chances of actually transcending it become incredibly limited. So, mm. so 
to me, it's on all levels, right? There's sort of this hierarchy of the density of a human experience. We could say spirit is the most powerful, but also the most like esoteric and ephemeral. Whereas, you know, you come into the lingo of your subconscious, it's these blind spots, hard to access. You're, you're certainly aware of your conscious thoughts and you're definitely aware of how you feel, right? So it's really this cascade, they're all interlinked. So for me, I want to make sure that I come really from the outside in to that deep feeling of pain and hurt. And if anyone has been on my mastermind, they would have witnessed that pretty much everyone I talk to at some point bursts into tears. That's accessing that somatic level. And then on the other side of that, what usually happens is they burst into laughter because the access to the freedom happens through, ironically, the suffering. As, as I, you know, tongue in cheek say, you know, Heaven is a place on earth. You just have to go through hell to get there. <laughs> oh man, I love it. That makes a lot of sense, Peter. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, um, so a little context for you, Peter, I don't know if you know, but my audience is very much, um, uh, let's say uh, also concerned about, uh, I like to just say it's a lack of a way, better way of putting it, the bullshit that's gone on in the world in the last three years, you know, and there's lots of aspects to that government overreach. You talked about the freedom aspect, corporate greed, pharmaceutical company greed, you know, uh, and there's a lot of concerning things, um, you know, that we're still dealing with. Um, it's difficult. One of the most common questions I get is, you know, how do we, have inner peace how do we keep our composure how do we not live in fear and live in that frequency when we have all of this all of these threats we we know the enemy you know whether it's a, the wef whether it's a political party whether it's government overreach socialism wokeism you know whatever it is that someone deems to be a threat what message do you have to people who are, are really having a difficult time just showing up and creating the life that they want to just creating a life to just just be able to survive let alone create the life that they've always wanted what message do you have to people who are really having a difficult time navigating through all of the external threats that we're facing right now it's tough and i'm glad that you know you see it and your audience is passionate about it i i think i'd start with love and compassion right like the in ways that I don't fully understand, you know, who is right now the father, the mother who's listening, who doing the best they can to work on themselves, but really in the back of their minds, they got laid off because they were non-essential. Um, they're struggling to pay their mortgage. They love their kids, but they also know the school that the kids go to are about to mandate some gene therapy shot that they don't want their kids to experience. So first of all, love and compassion, because they are real life, very tough conversations. Um, on the flip side, I always resort to, there's no external boogie monster. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and that's that might be the, that might be the title of this episode, Peter. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> there is no external boogie monster. It really occurs that way. And Gosh, it's a tough one for people to really comprehend, but it's the only access to true power and responsibility, right? You're in real lay terms, bringing it down to where the rubber meets the road. You're either a victim of life or you are the author of your own experience. So it's very seductive with what's going on. And I myself have at times, as I said, fallen prey to the hairs on the back of my neck standing up as any primal like you know instinct would bring a man who cares about society would bring um and that's when i myself reside uh, reside in trust right which is not naive and it's not resignation but in ways that i don't even comprehend even with my iq and intelligence the absolute carnage which could arguably be really put under the category of genocide that's occurred over the last two to three years, somehow, some fucking mad how is part of the evolution of our species, right? And it's tough to find those glimmers of hope or the signposts to us becoming a more civilized society in the face of, I just saw Ireland right now has 
got some new woke bill that just passed that if you have any hate speech towards LBGQ T whatever, you can go to you can go to jail for five years. It's like in, in Canada, up. there's in Canada where I'm from, there's fines. There's pretty heavy fines for anything that is deemed hate speech against LGBTQ two yeah. plus or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Dave MZ so like <laughs> bonkers, right? So 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 first of all, loving compassion, you know, a couple of deep breaths and uh and a lot of grace there in terms of like in ways that I do not comprehend, there is a greater intelligence at work. The only sort of saving grace that I have in regard to that, that at least reinforces my trust, is that much of the argument that we have seen, which is valid over the last two to three years, is the question of freedom, right? Like sovereignty, body choice, medical freedom, all of that. And I would assert that it's such a powerful and needed conversation, but it's on the back of the illusion of freedom, right? So, so that's where I do see this progression, this evolution of consciousness is that people are up in arms about their freedoms being taken away. What they're oblivious to is that they were in the illusion of freedom that wasn't true freedom. So if we were to look at the genesis of freedom and that, the various stages of it, then where we're in is actually an evolved stance relative to thinking we're free, but not being free, right? So in, I forgot if it was Maslow, but there's these hierarchies of consciousness, right? So we have at the bottom level, we are unconsciously incompetent. Then we become consciously incompetent. And then we become consciously competent and then finally unconsciously competent, right? So I think we've gone from being unconsciously incompetent, meaning we were oblivious to what was going on, the sex trafficking, the hideous corruption and oppression and tyranny in governments everywhere, the absolute corporate greed, the murdering of people through these horrific products that they pump out, but well known by the people in these organizations. And so we've become now consciously incompetent, <laughs> right? Which isn't necessarily a joyous place to be, but relative to being unconsciously incompetent, it is a, it's an upgrade. And I think we're working towards being consciously competent until such time it becomes second nature. So this is what I do with my athletes or anyone I work with. And I would assert sort of I'm embodying myself at a certain degree is I've gone to a place where this kind of experience of freedom not being triggered, it's second nature now, right? It's an unconsciously competent way that I deal with life. And occasionally I dip back down into being consciously competent where, oh, right, I'm being, I'm a bit upset by what's going on in the world, right? So, so that's what I would say is that, yeah, it's, it's all of it, right? Embrace the human experience of this is bullshit. This is terrible. My uncle, my wife, you know, they literally died within two weeks of this experiment or, you know, they've been fired or whatever they've been, whatever's occurred that is totally unjust it warrants all the human experiences. And okay, in the face of that, what do you stand for? And that's why, again, I revert to, I'm a stand for people's freedom and greatness, which is why I speak out. Now, will that lead to my demise? I don't know, but as I tell people, yeah, it might be scary to speak out or feel unsafe to speak out, but I truly believe it's way more unsafe to not speak out. <laughs> yeah, and I think maybe one of the most important things you said is the uh, distinguishing between like anger and being triggered uh, and just being passionate. I think that's obviously a, you know, a huge distinction. And it's like, okay, I can be passionate about speaking up against all of these things. I can, you know, focus on what I can control first off, because we don't want to dwell on the things in which that are completely and entirely out of our control. But if we can write the letter, if we can vote, if we can maybe stand in a group and stand up for what we believe in, like, sure, you know, let, let's, let's be passionate about those things, but let's be careful about making sure we remember that true freedom lies within you know victor frankel comes to mind with his quote between stimulus and response there is a space yeah. between that space lies our ability to respond in that response lies our growth and our freedom yeah so it's mandela found freedom whilst in prison right right so that's why i said there's no external boogeyman now does that mean that we don't take action no absolutely i mean i i don't foresee cancer in my future based on the way i think the way i 
take care of myself, the food I eat, but I don't know what my DNA has in store and what toxins are in the air between chemtrails and all the glyphosate sprayed all over the world. And so would I then just be at peace and not do anything? I would be at peace, not triggered, but I'm still going to take action, right? So there may be, as there are the case in many of my friends and families, you know, the take your kids out of school. There may be move cities. I move states myself. I just bought some land you know, so that I can grow my own food. Like I'm taking action to be responsible and be a stand for my own values and the things that I believe in. And now I know that's easier said than done. I, it took me a while to buy the land. Like, you know, there's other things in, to account for, like saving money, getting resources. Do you make a syndicate of families that create a commune? You know, a lot of this stuff is happening. It's, it's, a, it's a healthy response to what you're a stand for versus just being in victimhood. So it's both, right? It's like accepting the madness of the world, but not accepting as a passive thing, but rather, okay, this is occurring. How can I best respond to this in a way that gives me a feeling of responsibility and power? Yeah, surrendering to external uh, conditions does not mean you have to be stupid, right? Like your cancer example, or if you're sitting out on a hot day and a bee comes on your arm and you just say, oh, I, Kaylor told me I have to surrender when you have a whole other arm and you can chew it away before it stings you, right? It's, um, yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, that's that's actually really useful, I think, for, for uh, our audience. I think they're going to find that really useful uh, as I did. Um, last question here, Peter, as we wrap up, I want to know, what is a non-negotiable non-negotiable for you every day just in terms of you know it could be a physical thing just something that you do not negotiate on you need it to show up so that you can you know perform at the level in which you want to perform or feel the way you want to feel um that's a great question i mean i don't want to be trite and say things like breathing and sleep but <laughs> you know um I'd like to think that there's so many things that I have by virtue of, you know, being a little long in the tooth and being around for a while, like I've learned to incorporate movement, um, some quiet time, whether people want to put it under the auspices of meditation, breath work, you know, now, do I check those boxes every day? I mean, obviously I'm moving just by virtue of being human, but, you know, dedicated conscious movement, I think is probably one of the top ones. Um, and presence, you know, like I would say presence is one is arguably the number one non-negotiable, right? And what that delineates for me is that like right now to 1156 here where I am, I'm, I'm with you. Now, do I have a to-do list that is arguably over 500 items? Yes, <laughs> but if I were to have any attention on them, then I'm not here. And the only place that we truly have power in life is where we are. So I would argue that the non-negotiable is to the best of anyone's ability is try on presence, listen to what people are saying, pay attention to what you're eating, you know, drive the car versus like looking for something on the floor or picking up your phone because it's scooted off the passenger seat, you know, be where you are because both, it's the only place you have power, but it's also the only place you have fulfillment. Whereas most people, I, uh, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, I say most people are trying to be somewhere they're not. Mm. Peter, I live for these conversations. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you for being here and giving us your time. And most importantly, your presence, as you mentioned, I can tell, I can really, really tell that you are present. And uh, that's a difficult thing, uh, you know, when you have a lot going on. Um, tell our audience, do you have anything you want them to visit, take advantage of anything and everything that you want to wrap up here with? Um, I mean, thank you. It's been a joy to be with you. And I equally look for these conversations. Uh, they're, they're such a joy, especially to be someone with your uh, eloquence and intelligence. So, uh, hopefully that comes across to the audience. Um, Best places to find me for more is just my Instagram, which is Peter Crone or at Peter Crone, and then equally my website, petercrone.com. Depending on when this comes out, I don't know what might be offering. I, I'm sort of maybe going to take a little bit of a break and finish my book that everybody has uh, been badgering me, rightly so, to get out there. Um, but you know, if there is anything to explore or 
be a part of like a mastermind, it will be, you know, on either of those two platforms. Amazing. Uh, and what, what's the boogeyman quote again? One more time. Uh, there's no boogeyman outside of us. Outside of us. Okay. Amazing. I love that. That's one of my yeah. favorites. Uh, ultimately, okay. and again, it's a big, big take on, right, for any human being that ultimately we are the generator of our own experience. So, you know, the tyranny, the corruption, not denying its presence, but uh, what level are we taking that on to discover our own version of tyranny within ourselves? Mm. Damn, that's a good place to end, Peter. Thanks again, brother. You're welcome.